favorite thing about mom is probably that she's so caring and I love that about her. One of my favorite things about my mom is her generosity. She can always make room for one or 30 more people. And I love for my mom because she's the best mom ever. <laughs> my favorite thing about my mom is how good she makes her food. How amazing her hugs are. My favorite thing about my mom is that I know whenever I come home, she'll greet me with a huge smile and wide open arms. I feel very welcome to be back. You make the best hugs because <laughs> they're the best. The most amazing thing about my mom is how intentional she is uh, about her relationships and especially her relationship with God. My mom is an amazing mom because she has such a big heart. She's always looking for ways that she can serve other people. I love how easy it is to talk to my mom. My mom is amazing at cooking. My mom is amazing at giving advice. My mom is amazing at um, sweet meats. I love you making dinner too. Mom, I want you to know that I owe so much of who I am directly to you. Mom, I want you to know I love you. I love you, Mom. I love you. I love you, Mom. Love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. Mom, I love you so, so, so much. I love you, Mom. Happy, Happy Mother's Day, Day Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. I don't want to, I don't want to upset anyone or beef with anybody in the church, but I hands down have the best mom in the world. Welcome to the Cascades Baptist Church online service. We're glad you're here. Mark 12:30 says, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength." And to love God is to worship Him. So this morning, as you watch this video with all of us, worship the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Let's worship our God together. Psalm 150 says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with tambourine and dancing. Praise Him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise Him with loud cymbals and praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this time that we are able to, to come together. Although the, the circumstances may not um, be what we long for and we desire for, at this moment, but God, I thank you for the ability to um, still be in one body, uh, in spirit and in truth, God. And so I pray this morning that as we uh, come together, as we sing songs, as we hear your word being preached, God, that we would feel a stirring in our heart, uh, God, and a longing in our heart to to come before you, to repent of our sins and to Lord, just worship you and glorify you for who you are. God, that we would receive forgiveness in you this morning. God, that we would receive peace in you this morning. Uh, and Lord, it's just in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning, Cascades Church family. I'm glad that you're able to join us again on this Lord's Day. And this is week four for our sermon series called The Gathered and the Sent. Now, before we get into that, we're talking about prayer today. And the, bar, the bigger conversation is we're talking about what church actually is. But before we get into that, I just want to say this. I have been praying all week long, every single day. I'm praying this morning and Sunday morning as well, that you are going to have a powerful experience with the living God. So if you call Cascades uh, Church your home, if if you're a believer in Jesus, uh, but you're someplace else out in internet land somewhere and you're just kind of tuning in, or if you, you're you not a believer in Jesus Christ, it's my prayer that you're going to have a powerful experience with the living God. If you're not a believer, I would love to be able to have a conversation with you. Contact us, shoot us an email, uh, give me your phone number, I'll give you a call. We want you to know who God is, who know who Jesus is, to know what Jesus has done for you. And if you, if you know that, if you've put your faith and your trust in Jesus, then I want you to be able to walk away this morning through our worship, through our times of prayer together, and certainly through the teaching of God's Word, and to have an experience with God that rocks you, that shapes you, uh, that just grabs you where you're at. I think when this whole pandemic first sort of hit us, as a nation especially, as Americans, there was this initial rallying to, hey, let's do whatever it takes, um, and we and and whatever whatever that is, if we got to shut down our businesses, if we've got to kind of close our doors to our homes and to kind of stay shut in, whatever we need to do, we'll, we we'll do whatever we need to do for the sake of our neighbor. And I was just so overwhelmed and pleased to see that. And that spirit is still there. I'm not denying that at all. And in fact, I'm very thankful that that spirit still exists to the degree that it does. But but now there there is a, a growing ses, sense of weariness, right? A, a growing sense of anxiety, a growing sense of maybe even frustration as to when is this going to end. And along with that, there's also plans for reentry. What in different states and different sometimes even counties uh, are, are are kind of coming out with their plans, and some of those are more immediate. I mean, you have states that are opening up churches. Uh, already, you have some states that are saying it's going to be a year or maybe more before churches and other large venues can meet. And so it's all over the map in terms of what's going to be happening. There's a lot of uncertainty, and with uncertainty comes frustration and anxiety. And so many of us find ourselves in a situation where we want to be joyous, we want to be happy, we want to be missional, we want to stay focused on loving God, loving others, being positive, sharing God's truth. But yet there's this growing sense of turmoil, this growing sense of anxiety. So there is no better moment. There's no better moment to have a powerful experience with the living God. And there's no better way for you to have that powerful experience with God than through prayer. Prayer is this phenomenal thing where you, as a human individual, get to be in direct communication with the creator of the universe, a creator who is powerful who is sovereign, right, who always hears you, and who loves you. Theologians use some terms that are a little bit heady, but we've thrown these terms around for a long time, so they've kind of been out there. And the one is omnipresent. God is everywhere, which means he hears everything, right? Uh, God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's supreme. He's completely sovereign. He can do everything. He can do anything that he wants to do. But this omnipotent, this omnipresent God is a God who radically loves you and invites you on a moment-by-moment -moment basis to enter into his presence via prayer. But you're told that you can boldly go in prayer before the throne of God. You can go before the throne of God, not in a cocky way, not in a prideful way, but in a way that recognizes you have this inherent right to be there. Not because of what you've done. And we, we understand that as believers in Jesus Christ, that we didn't do anything for our salvation. Right? We didn't, we didn't go to the gates of heaven and bang on the door and say, I deserve to be let in because I've lived this amazing life. That's, that's always been the false religion. Actually, no matter what other religion other than gospel Christianity is, it's always some version of that. It's some version of you trying to earn your way to God. But Christianity says that you have a right to come before God boldly, not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus has done. 
Jesus is the one who's provided a way of salvation. Jesus is the one who came and rescued you. Jesus is the one who found you trapped in your sins. Jesus is the one who came and found you, the Bible tells us, dead in your sins, that he made you spiritually alive. And so you don't come into the throne room of God in prayer and kind of kick the doors open and say, here I am, I've got a right to be here. Instead, you go in with humility because you're talking to the sovereign king of the universe, but with confidence knowing that you are a beloved son or a beloved daughter and you will not be thrown out on your ear. You will not be refused entry. God will not turn a deaf ear to you. He loves you. He wants you there in his presence. That's what the Bible means when it says boldly come into this throne of grace. Someone who knows because of what Jesus has done, you are a son or daughter of the King of Kings, and you get to be there. It is your inherent right because of Jesus. It's your inherent right to come before God and talk to him in prayer. But if you can, turn with me to Acts chapter 2 and listen along as I read these words. It says this in verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are now far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So the beginning and the end of that section of the Bible that we just looked at, it begins with this call to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And we're told in that verse that 3,000, about 3,000 individuals accepted Jesus that day, right right on the spot. And then immediately after that, uh, we, we kind of get this description of what their first day as a believer looked like. And then, of course, the implication is that that continued on in the following days. This was their new normal, their new reality. But it begins with 3,000 became believers. And then in verse 47, the, the kind of the end of that little section, it says that even more came to faith, right? So you have 3,000 individuals accept Jesus. And within hours, within hours, those 3,000 individuals are going out the scent, right? The gathered and the scent, and they're going out and they're sharing their faith with others and others are coming to faith in Jesus Christ as well. I mean, it, it was this remarkable time period. But what, what, we're, what we've been looking at is what happens in between those two things, right? So 3,000 become believers the same day. Those 3,000 then kind of go out and become missionaries in their own world. And really, everybody, everybody's a missionary. Everybody's an evangelist. Everybody is part of this mission that God's given us. We don't all go to Papua New Guinea. We don't all go to Italy. We don't all go to Brazil. Uh, but we're all missionaries. We're, we're all evangelists. We're all teachers of God's word. We're all people who share the gospel with others. That's sort of the mission. But we've been looking at the in-between. And the in-between is described in this way. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So we're looking at that next week. What does it mean to come together and, 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 to, and to study God's word together? Why do we even do that? What do we even mean by this term, apostles' teaching? But they also devoted themselves to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, right? We did that last Sunday, if you were with us, and to prayer. And prayer is what we're looking at today. So when we think of this concept of prayer, it, it's so important to, to Luke. It's so important to Paul and to Peter, which would have been the big influences on Luke, 
It's so important to the, all of the apostles in the early church that prayer made it into the, to the top four list of activities uh, that the early church did. It was one of the first experiences of people who converted from their former way of living. A lot of them would have been Jews coming to faith in Jesus Christ, but frankly, many of them would have been what we called Hellenized Jews, or basically pretty liberal Jews, right? They they were Jews in name only, but they lived a lot like the Romans lived, maybe even had some pagan, cultic, uh, false religions of the Greco-Roman world kind of brought into their life a little bit. They accepted Jesus as their savior, And their first day, their new reality as a believer in Jesus Christ is to listen to the other believers around them and then to participate themselves in the act of communicating with the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who formed them and their their mother's womb, the God who sent Jesus to save them. Not only were they saved, they now had this real verbal connection with the living God, the creator of the universe. And Paul uses a word, or Luke uses a word here that I don't want us to escape. Now, I'm I'm reading out of the NIV. Your translation might use a, a synonym or a related word that says approximately the same thing. But the NIV says they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to listening to the apostles teach. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to, to taking breaking of bread together, and they devoted themselves to prayer. And so if we're going to understand kind of biblically what prayer is and why the Bible keeps bringing it up all the time, the New Testament and the Old Testament does a lot too, but the New Testament brings up prayer constantly over and over. We see commands to pray, encouragement to pray, pleading to pray, examples of people praying, the Apostle Paul asking for the believers in various churches to pray for him, giving them specific prayer requests. Paul saying, hey, I'm praying for you. We have examples in the Gospels of Jesus regularly going out by himself in prayer, trying to pull the apostles into a spirit of prayer with him, letting the apostles listen in as he's praying to God the Father. So prayer is everywhere in the New Testament. But Luke uses this term. He says that he that the, these early one day spiritually old believers in Acts two forty two devoted themselves to prayer. This word devoted, the, or at least the Greek word that's that's behind this English word, uh, is used ten times in the New Testament. Of, of, of those 10 times that it's used, four of them have to do with being devoted specifically to prayer. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, so this is before, uh, one chapter before where we're at in our scripture reading today, it describes this scene with a, a much smaller group of believers who are huddled together in a room. Uh, still kind of waiting on the Holy Spirit to come, not exactly sure what's going to be happening. And it says this, they were all of one mind and were continually devoting themselves to prayer, right? In fact, one of the primary reasons why this massive spiritual evangelistic awakening occurred with the Holy Spirit coming down and just sort of flooding the hearts and minds of people, 3,000 individuals coming to faith in Jesus Christ, those 3,000 immediately turning around and witnessing and evangelizing to others came about because there was a smaller group of believers back in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, who were of one mind, and they were huddled together continually in steadfast, devoted prayer. We also see in in Acts chapter 6, there the scene is a little bit different. The church has already been birthed. It's already been growing. Uh, It's spreading out now multiple thousands of people. In addition to the 3,000 have come to faith in Jesus Christ. The burdens of doing ministry with that amount of people is vast and varied and difficult. And the apostles, because the pastors weren't around yet, the apostles had the, had the task of not only going out and being apostles and evangelists and missionaries and overseeing this entire thing, they also were leading and overseeing the local churches. And so what they did is they asked those local churches in Acts chapter 6, 
uh, to go and appoint deacons, which is this new sort of invented position in Acts 6 that we continue and have today in our churches. Deacon just simply means servant, this official servant or servants of the church who oversee the ministry programs and the functions of the church. But it's the reason that the apostles created that position that we need to take note of. In Acts chapter 6, it tells us that the reason for deacons is so that they, the apostles, could spend their time devoted to prayer and to teaching God's word. Devoted to prayer. Again, that same word appears again, devoted to prayer and devoted to teaching God's word. In Romans 12, 12, Paul says this, uh, he encourages believers to be rejoicing in hope, to be persevering in tribulation. And the third one should catch our eye. The third one is this, devoted to prayer, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, and devoted to prayer. And he puts three things together which belong together. How can you have hope and persevere in the midst of persecution, in the midst of tribulation? Well, for Paul, the answer to that is to be devoted in prayer. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. All three of those things kind of go together. But those are the four times out of the ten times the word devoted is used, four of those times, specifically, it's this thing with prayer. First Thessalonians 5.17, Paul doesn't use the word devoted, but he says something pretty similar. He, he, he gives us this very brief command. And the command says this, that he's calling on us to pray without ceasing. To pray without ceasing. Yeah, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean you got to walk around 24-7 muttering prayers under your breath. People are just going to think you're crazy. That's not, what, that's not what that term means at all. In fact, if you go back to ancient Greek, uh, some of the writings that have been found, that term that we translate without ceasing in our New Testament in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 is found all throughout the Greek world. In one particular occurrence, this clearly isn't in the Bible, you have an individual describing a persistent cough, and he uses the same word. He was coughing without ceasing, right? the cough that carries with him throughout his day, a cough that he couldn't get rid of. If you were to go to your doctor's office today and just say, hey, doc, I, I, I've been having this persistent cough. I'm, I'm just coughing all the time. Your doctor would not believe that you literally meant that you are coughing nonstop without a nanosecond breath between your coughs literally for 24 hours. He would assume by that that throughout your day, this cough keeps returning. You, you might go a few minutes. You might go a few hours. You, you might even go several hours between bouts of having this cough, but this cough kind of keeps coming back and it keeps re returning to you. So in that sense, that without ceasing is, is used in a negative way. But Paul uses that same word in a positive way regarding prayer. Prayer should be such a part of our life. We should be so devoted to it, to bring it back to Acts 2.42. We should be so devoted to prayer that prayer is something that just keeps coming back into our life multiple times throughout our day. So if we're going to pray like the early church did, with that zeal, with that power, with that effectiveness, then, then praying with devotion, praying with commitment, praying with persistence is a huge part of that. In fact, Paul says something very similar in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. He says this, devote yourself to prayer, being watchful, and thankful. Now, he, he uses a, a slightly different word uh, for devote. We just translate it the same in English, but it means basically the same thing. To devote yourself, to commit yourself to prayer. But, but in Colossians 4.2, he also gives us two more aspects of what the early church's prayer life looked like that you and I need to incorporate in our life. He says, not only do you need to be devoted to prayer, but you need to be watchful as you pray. To be watchful. Now, that, that one strikes us as odd sometimes, because we don't usually think of prayers being watchful, because what is prayer? It's our head down, it's our eyes closed, it's us and Jesus at that moment. We're talking to God the Father. It is this powerful spiritual experience that we're having. We're trying to open our life up to Him. We're coming before Him and pleading something, right? Pleading for His assistance, maybe interceding for somebody else, maybe simply just trying to commune with the Father who created us, the Jesus who saved us, the Holy Spirit who empowers us. It's these kind of personal, profound 
uh, moments in, in our spiritual lives, we don't often associate that with being watchful. And when we look at that concept of being alert or being watchful in the New Testament, it appears in a couple of different ways. One, we're told in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert or be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to devour somebody. So the first thing that we're told to be watchful for here is to be watchful for the devil, right? He's the enemy. He's the opponent of God's people. There, there, is, there is a spiritual adversary. The New Testament takes spiritual warfare seriously. It takes the devil seriously. It refers to him as the adversary, your adversary, the devil, the apostle Peter tells us. Peter is an individual who knew what spiritual failure felt like. Because when he sinned, he sinned publicly. He sinned, to use the term of our president, bigly, right? He just sinned. And he sinned big when he sinned. But he also had a very big God, a very loving God, a very forgiving God, a very powerful God. Peter is you and I. If anybody, if I'm going to listen to anybody in the New Testament about taking the devil seriously, it's going to be Peter. Why Peter? Because Peter listened to that devil far too many times in his Christian life, right? Not just before he was a believer, but in his life as a believer, he listened far too often to the devil, the adversary. And only over time, so when we finally get to 1 Peter, the letter that he wrote from the verse that I read, it's this older, more mature Peter who fought spiritual battles and lost, right? Who's listened to the voice of the adversary, who's fallen to temptation. But through losing those battles, through falling to temptation, through listening to the wrong voice, he learned painfully and slowly that his God was the one who gives and grants victory. His God is the one who loves and forgives. And the devil has to be taken seriously. And if we don't take the devil seriously, like Peter, we're going to fall, right? So this is why I listen to Peter. We listen to everybody in the Bible, but Peter is speaking to something that he knows about. He has personal experience with. And not just watchful for the devil, but watchful for temptation as well. Now, the devil uses temptation in our life, but listen, even if the devil wasn't involved, you've got a whole lot of temptation going on in your own personal life. I've got a whole lot going involved in my personal life. I don't even need the devil to make my life difficult, right? Now, he, he just makes it worse. But there's so much inner temptation that you and I struggle with. This is why Jesus tells us in Matthew 26, Keep watching and praying. He ties those two things together, watching and praying, that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? That's not the only things, though, the devil, temptation. But we're also told, Matthew 24, again in Matthew 25, to be watchful for the return of Jesus. I mean, this is part of what it is as well, to be waiting and watching for Jesus's return. The devil is real. He's an adversary. Our sin is real. It's an adversary in our life. But also the recognition that our Jesus can come back anytime, any day, any moment, and he wants us to be ready. He wants us to be in a spirit of victory. He wants us to be faithfully serving him when he comes. I'm not saying your salvation is not on the line. If Jesus comes back and you're in your bad Peter moment, right, where you've been listening to the devil and you're sinking in the water or you're kind of backing away from your backslidden at the moment, it's not like Jesus is going to come up. I didn't find you ready. I'm not taking you with me. If you've put your faith and your trust in Jesus, you stand firm in your salvation. Jesus is just asking you to stand firm in your walk as well. You're firm in your salvation. That's all Jesus. But he wants you to be firm in your walk as well, because he's not only saved you from something, he saved you for something. And so Paul is telling us, Luke is telling us, other places are telling us that not not only are we to be devoted to prayer, we're to be watchful as we pray. In fact, that should impact how you and I 
pray, Father, protect me from the devil. Father, give me the strength not to give in to temptation. As your pastor, are you praying that I won't give in to temptation? I hope you are. I need those prayers in my life. Bathe me with that spiritual power. I am bathing you in that power on a daily basis. At the beginning of this whole COVID thing, I've said publicly a few different times that I am lifting up, going through the directory, I'm lifting up every congregant by name every single day. It, it does. It takes a good chunk of my time. But I'm, I'm so glad to do it. And I'm not just saying, hey, I pray for so-and-so. Keep them happy. Keep them strong. Keep them safe. Keep them from getting COVID. I'm praying those things too. But part of what I'm praying is that God would keep you from temptation, that you won't give in to sin that day, that you will be a mighty and victorious warrior for Jesus Christ, that you will, through your faith in Jesus, hold up your hand and say, not today, devil, right? That you would be watchful to sin and temptation, that you would be ready for the return of our Jesus, that you would be spiritually awake and wary of your adversary, the devil, who is a prowling lion seeking whom he can devour. And by the way, it's you in part that he seeks. And and the last point I want to make is this. When you pray, I mean, yeah, pray uh, in a devoted way, pray persistently, pray watchfully, pray thankfully, but also pray to be changed. If we go to God only to change God, if we go to God only to move God, if we go to God only to get something from God. I think we're missing the point of prayer. So yes, we go to God to move God to action, at least from our perspective anyway. But ultimately, in a very powerful way, prayer is meant to change us. C.S. Lewis actually famously said that. He said that prayer, actually, the real purpose of prayer is to change us, not change God. And when, when you and I look at prayer as this one-way thing, it becomes, in, in many people's mind, like the old pagan myths of old, where we're trying to just motivate some deity to do our will. That's why they would do sacrifices, and that, that's why they would pray, and that's why they would spend all of this time uh, and these ornate praises to some deity that they worship to try to trick or motivate uh, or bribe that deity to do something for them. That's not what Christian prayer is. You're not talking to some snake god or some river god or some sun god that can be manipulated according to the myths of old. You're talking to the creator of the universe, the one that doesn't need you but has decided to love you, the one who has saved you and embraced you, the one that created the stars in the sky and he breathed life into your soul and he's given you mission and purpose and he's called you to be his son and his daughter. And yes, we go to him to plead, to intercede for others, to pray for Christian workers, to pray for the doors of evangelism to be flung open, to pray for effectiveness as those evangelists, ourselves included, share their faith with others. But we also pray to be changed. And really, again, one of the best places to see the power of prayer in the life of a believer to see how prayer changes a believer is in the passage that we looked at, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They got together, they worshiped together, they fellowshiped together, they listened to teaching together, and they prayed together, and they were changed because of it. When we actually begin to pray, it changes us. And the last thing that your adversary wants you to be, the last thing this worldly, godless system wants you to be that you and I are surrounded by is to be someone who is zealous, effective, and bold for Jesus Christ. But the only way you become zealous, 
The only way you become effective, the only way you become bold is to be someone who's devoted to prayer, devoted, persistent, devoted to being watchful, devoted to being thankful, and devoted to being changed. As you come before God in the spirit of one-on-one communication, and you just begin to talk to him. I don't know what's on your agenda today. I don't know what you got going on. It's an important day. It's Mother's Day. You better be spending time with your mom if your mom's still alive, or reflecting on your mom if your mom's already passed, or uh, just enjoying the day in as much as you can. This is a special day. And yes, I want you to make this day about your mom in so many ways, but also make this day about Jesus. Make this day about praying to the Father. The Bible has invited you, it's commanded you, it's encouraged you, it's shown you what happens when you come boldly before the throne of grace. Maybe today, for the remainder of the day, try to put 1 Thessalonians 5.17 into practice. Let prayer be something that kind of just hangs on you, something that returns to you at multiple points throughout your day. Maybe that means you get on your hands and knees. Maybe that means you bow your head and close your eyes. Maybe that means you just quietly whisper to yourself. Maybe that means you go and find a prayer closet, go out into the garage, you're going to your bathroom and lock the door, wherever you can be by yourself, and spend multiple moments throughout your day with the God who saved you, the God who seeks to change you, and the God who always loves you. Father God, we lift up the congregation to you right now. The assembly of believers, now in our own individual homes, but nevertheless assembled through the unity of the Holy Spirit. And Father, my prayer for them is that you put a spirit of prayer on all of our hearts. May this day we just come before you, intercede to you, make requests of you, shower you with praise, offer you our thanksgiving, offer you the recognition that you alone are worthy of all blessing and honor and glory and power. Change us as we come before you in prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen.
hope our online service was a blessing to you. We'd love to connect with you further, and a great way to do that is by joining one of our online Zoom Sunday School classes. There's even a class for kids. You can get links to those on the Cascades Baptist Church Facebook page, as well as in the Cascades Church app. Bye!